Hi everyone, welcome to our final webinar series of the Clinician Engineer Hub Summer School with our theme being coding. This is just a quick shout out to say to everyone, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date with our latest events. And it's my pleasure once again to introduce Josh and feel free to post any questions throughout the talk and Josh will then answer them as we go along. So over to you, Josh. Awesome. Thank you very much, Chloe and Maria. Really excited to be back here. Um, what we're going to do this week is um, we're going to try and build on what we've already done a fair bit. We're going to try and add uh, a fair bit of new functionality to the programs that we can write. We're going to look at some new programming patterns. Um, and then towards the end, we're going to look at how you might um, sort of compile one of your own computer programs using a code that's written by other people. It's going to get fairly uh, difficult towards the end. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress too much if you don't understand this whole class from start to finish, because it's the last class for this little run of classes in the summer school. Uh, I thought, um, I guess showing you a little bit, um, about what's possible uh, would be of more value than showing you every little uh, every little detail of how you might get there. Uh, so I am going to do my best to make it as clear as possible. And I, for the third time, I promise to have the chat open. And I've got it very open and in front of me, so I can see if you have questions. So please fire them in as we go. Um, but let's get cracking, hey? Um, so the, for the very first, um, thing that we're going to do is if you want to get your name up on screen at the end of the class, um, you should, uh, pull out your phone. I'm going to do it now to pull out your phone and tap on this QR code, which is going to open the Twitter thread that I posted for this class. And in the comments section, I'd like you to leave it, um, an order for a coffee. So I'm going to do mine right now. Um, um, so if you leave in the comment section order for a coffee, we'll do something uh, cool with that later on in the class. All right. Um, what's next? Oh yeah. So a lot less preambling this week. We're going to go dive straight into some code. <clears throat> Um, and we're going to very briefly touch on the, the patterns we touched on previously. So the first thing we learned, uh, or one of the things we learned was variables. So recall that we can create a variable um, and, and in PHP they're identified by this dollar sign. Um, and I can name it anything I like. And if I use a single equal sign, I can assign a value to that variable. So in this case, I'm assigning a, a, a set of um, letters or, or numbers and letters known as a string. So this is a string. I can echo that out into our, um, or I can yield that out into our terminal window using the echo keyword. So when I run the script here, you can see that it's outputted the name. Okay. Um, we also learn a little bit of arithmetic, so plus, minus, multiplication, division. I'm not going to go into too much detail there. I think they're largely um, explained at this point. Uh, the next pattern that we learned was, were if statements. So recall that when I have an if statements. Um, uh, so let's set... Let's age to less than say 20, let's say age equals 20. And in these circular brackets, um, any, any expression that I put into these circular brackets will be evaluated. If that, if that expression in the, circular, uh, in the circular brackets is true, and let me give you an example of an expression that would be true. If age is less than um, 25, so in this case, this expression, age is less than 25, is true because age is 20. So in the case that this expression is true, this code block will run. Um, 
Otherwise, uh, whatever is after it will 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 run. So if I put something in here, um, congratulations, under twenty five. Um, if I run this now, yeah, we get this output. Congratulations, you're under 25. And the reason for that is the expression in the circular brackets is true and therefore this code block runs. If, however, I change the age, now this expression is going to be false because 30 is not less than 25. And as a result, this code block will not run. So let's try running it here. As you can see, we get no, no output. When I run the script, we didn't get um, that, that, that string to be outputted to the screen, okay? Um, so I guess the other thing to, to mention, I probably should have led with this, is that at this stage, anytime uh, we see a, a script, we should understand that a computer, as a general rule, um, reads it from left to right and from top to bottom, just like any human would, except that a computer will be excruciatingly uh, literal or excruciatingly specific in how that they will how they will interpret um, what we write, and this can become a, a bit of a, an issue um, as our prog programs get more complex. But um, we'll we'll touch on that as that happens. All right, the next thing to do to extend this pattern um, that we've already covered is the else statement. So an else statement is, an ex is a, a block of code with these curly brackets that you can set up to run in the case that your if statement fails. So when this, when this expression is false and this code block is skipped, um, we can set up this else expression that will run in the meantime. So knowing that we've already got an example set up where this code block is false, we can put something else here. We can say echo, um, congratulations, you're over 25. If we run that here, Congratulations, you're over 25 is, is put out into the, into the terminal window, all right? Um, so that's if and else statements, all right. Now we did, in previous lessons, we've done a few, a few more kind of simple exercises around this. We built this, uh, a BMI calculator, which let us practice our basic arithmetic. And we did a few instances of where if statements might be useful for us, um, but there's, there's two, maybe three more patterns that we need to talk about to actually um, uh, um, build what I want to build in today's class. And I just want to reiterate, if you don't understand today's class from top to bottom, that's totally fine. And it's, it's totally reasonable. I've actually crammed a lot in, all right? So don't, don't, don't fret. If you do have specific questions, please, please fire them away. All right. So let's say um, what we're going to talk about now is a thing called arrays. And arrays are a list of, are, are a special variable that let us store lists of values. So let's say I'm writing an app for a hospital and this hospital app has to store information about patients and their, and their, and their admission. Let's say, um, one way that I could do this is by, you know, having these variables like this. So patient one equals, you know, Chloe, patient two equals Maria, um, patient three equals Josh, um, patient four is Socrates. All right. Now this would get fairly tired fairly quickly. The reason for that is uh, my app would be, uh, well, you know, if I did it this way, I would only ever be able to have four patients because I've defined four variables and a, an app that can only store four patients wouldn't be too exciting. What I need is some way to store a variable amount of information. 
So I want my app to work if I've got zero patients or if the hospital is full and there's 700 patients in the hospital. In this case, we use an array. And the way that we define an array is just like we define any other variable. So we use it, this dot line. We use a single equal sign to assign it a value. And in, to define an array in PHP, we use these square brackets. So all these unusual looking brackets that you've had on your keyboard for many years are now sort of uh, declaring themselves as something of use in programming. So in arrays, we use um, circular brackets. In, um, we know in our if statements, we use the, excuse me, these are rounded brackets. Um, in our if statements, we know that we use our rounded brackets. Um, in our, um, elsewhere in our if statements, um, excuse me, we, all, we also use these, um, these squiggly line brackets. But coming back to our arrays, we use these these, circ uh, these square brackets. And inside the square brackets, we put a comma separated list of the values that we want to store in our array. So let me give you an example. In this case, we're going to use, we're going to use a very similar example to what we did last time. We're going to have Maria, Chloe, Josh, Socrates. So note here that I've got a set of um, square brackets and then a, a list of values that I want to store in my array, each separated by a comma. Okay, so now I've got a list of values. And um, just to reiterate, the re reason that this is a useful thing to do is that I can add and subtract things from this list and it will expand or shrink as much as I want it to, to fit this list could, you know, fit thousands of patients if I wanted to. If I wanted to have thousands of patients to client um, in each variable individually, I'd have to declare a thousand variables and that would not be a practical way to write a program. So once we've got information stored in an array, how can we access the information in an array? Um, and for this very simple type of array, what we can do is access each value using the, um, the, the index of the value. So in this case, and this is, this is a pattern that um, persists across most programming languages, when you define an array or a list, um, the value, uh, this is the value at index zero, this is the value at index one, this is the value at index two, and this is the value at index three. So our values index is really where it sits in the array. And I'm usually, for reasons I won't go into, that value starts at zero. So if I try, if I type patient, uh, patience, because that's the name of the array, and then in these square brackets, I put zero. Let's have a look at what the, um, just, just ignore this. This is our new line character that makes it a bit easier to read. So if I write um, patience zero into our, um, oops. You can see that patient zero is equal to Maria. Um, and if I do patience, one, that will be equal to Chloe. Pretty cool. And then naturally I can do the same with two and with three. That's me. If I change it to three, we get Socrates himself. So this is how, once we've defined an array, um, we can then access any of the individual values in any way, in a very similar way to the way that we would access any other variable that we've already made and already used up until this point. Um, we can then, uh, and because we can access each individual value in this way, um, we can also change the value in any, any way that we want. So if let's say I wanted to change 
let's say my mom was writing this computer program and she wants to change my name from Josh to Joshua. So she, uh, in the same way that we um, echo the value at index two, we can also assign, remember our single, single equal sign helps us assign a new value. So patients, the, the value at index two of the patients array is now equal to Joshua. So if I echo that now, you can see that our output is Joshua. Okay. Um, so arrays help us store lists of values. And that's one of the themes we're gonna use in this class. Now, th there are actually two main types of arrays in PHP. The first one is a numerically indexed array. So this is, this is a numerically indexed array. And the reason for that is the, number, the, the values sit at uh, a number in the array. So remember that this is value zero, this is value one, this is value two, this is value three. And it's numerically indexed because I can access the values in this list using numbers. Alternatively, there's a second type of array that I won't spend too long on, okay? And in the, it's called an associative array. And in an associative array, you access the values using words rather than numbers. And I'll give you a very simple example uh, right here. Okay, so let's get rid of all this. So to introduce an associative array, instead of using a comma separated list of individual values, we use a comma separated list of key value pairs. Okay, let me give you an example. So this, in this case, um, our key is going to be the word name, and the value is going to be Socrates. So that, this is a comma, because remember it's a comma separated list of key value pairs. So the name is going to be Socrates, and then the um, age is going to be 2490. And then the, let's do allergies. And this, uh, and this patient is going to have an allergy to penicillin. Okay, so this is, a, this is an associative array. It's a, oh, that should be a comma. It's an associative array, um, which is a list of key value pairs. It's just like, it's just like any other array, any numerically indexed array, except when I want to access a value in this array, instead of, so instead of going, you know, patient zero, patient one, patient, uh, patient one, or patient two to access the values, I'm actually going to use the key so let's say I want to echo the patient name. And there you, there you get it, I get Socrates. Okay. And then if I want to get the age, I can do the same thing and we get the age there. All right. Again, the minutiae of this class might be a little bit hard to follow because I'm going to come actually very hard with lots of information, but by the end, um, hopefully you'll start to see the bigger picture of how all of these things can fit together into a, a program, okay? All right, let's learn a new pattern. So for this example, we need a quite simple array, all right? So we're gonna use, we're gonna make an associate, excuse me, a numerically indexed array. And so to make our array, you have a comma separated list of values in between our square brackets. So we're gonna, we're gonna have some human bones here. Scapula, humerus, ulna, radius. Okay, so I've got, my, I've got my array here and 
note that I've, I've, I've spread the definition out over many lines, but this is the same as it being in one line. It's just a, it's just a style thing. It's a preference thing. Okay. And the pattern we're going to learn now is a thing called a for each loop. In other languages, it's called a for loop. And what a for each loop lets you do is cycle through an array and run a piece of code, a code block, with every value in the array. And this is a really common thing that you want to do when you're writing a computer program. As an example, on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, if, I, if you go into your friends section and you click friends and there's a big list of all of your friends, um, a, something similar to a for each loop is likely what helps the developers of that social media website to show you your friends. If you've got a thousand friends and you need them in a big list, you don't want to have to write that and you're trying to show it on a website, for example, you don't want to have to, to type out a thousand little uh, HTML elements to rip, to show each friend. You want to write one element and then duplicate it as many times as you need for that, for the, for the number of friends that you have. So let, let's, it might be a bit clearer with an example. So to introduce a for each loop, I write the word for each and then I have my round brackets again. And then I introduce some curly brackets, which are the code block that I'm going to repeat multiple times. Okay. So for each, uh, so you, you write for each and you have your rounded brackets and inside you put an array. So note that bones is that this array that we've defined up here. Okay. And what this code block will do is it will go through each value of the array and it will re repeat this code block for us. Okay. So I'm going to go for each bones as bone. All right. And so this, this as keyword can be a little bit confusing, but basically what this means is for every value of the bones array, run this script. Run, run this code block with the value of the array stored in the bone variable. Okay, so let's, so let's do that now. So if I go, um, if I go echo bone, and then I'm just gonna put this, this new line character in, you can ignore this. <coughs> So for each value of bones, run this code block with the value of the array stored in the variable bone. So let's have a look what happens if, um, if we run it here. You can see that each of the values of the bones, uh, the names of the bones get the echoed, even though there's only one echo statement. Um, so each, each value of this array, for each value of this array, this code block is being run um, with the value of the array stored in the variable bone. So with one echo statement, we're getting four output. Uh, pretty cool. Let's, let's extend this a little bit. So, so um, if we use people, Going to do a very similar example where we have people in our list this time. So, Chloe, who else can I see? Adam, geez. Josh, who else is in the call? Let's have a look. Um, Shriyash. Just a few examples. Okay, so in this case, I've got people. So for each people as person, let's go, okay, um, equals one. We'll go 
um, person. We're going to use some concatenation that we learned about in the first two classes. Recall that concatenation lets us combine expressions. So person number number is person. Uh, equals number plus one. So basically what I've done here, can you clarify when each bracket is used? Asks Dr. B. Parentheses versus squiggly bracket versus straight bracket. I didn't register that part earlier. We will absolutely do that. I'll just finish this example and then we'll talk about when each bracket will be used. Um, so coming back to this example, this for each pattern that I'm trying to cover. So for a for, uh, uh, just in summary, for a for each loop, a for each loop takes an array, okay? And then it will run the following code block for every value in the array with that value substituted in as this, this variable. So you can see I'm, I'm referencing person here. So every time this code block runs, the first time this code block runs, person is equal to Maria. The second time this code block runs, person is equal to Chloe. The third time this code block runs, person is equal to Fatima and so on and so forth. As an additional layer of complexity here, I've created a new variable and I've started it at one. And every time this loop runs, I have um, set, the, uh, I've set the variable to the current value plus one. So I'm essentially adding one to this variable every time the code block runs. And let's have a look what happens if we run the script now. So you can see that I've, I've gen generated these sentences dynamically using a for each loop. Um, and if I add one more person to just to demonstrate the value of this, I've added another person to my list, uh, to my array, okay? And when I run the script, you can see that Nikhil gets automatically added to the end. So this is a very useful thing for me to use as a programmer. But when I, for example, if I'm writing an app for patients in a hospital, I don't know how many patients are gonna be there when I'm writing the web page. So I need something that will expand or contract in size to store that list of information. And so that's what an array does for us. Okay, so before we move on to the next pattern, um, I'm gonna answer Dr. B's question, which is, can you clarify when, when each bracket is used? The parentheses versus the squiggly bracket versus the straight bracket. I didn't register that part earlier. All right, so yeah, I can absolutely do that. So um, perhaps the easiest, um, one to start with are actually these squiggly brackets, okay? And so I, um, the squiggly brackets will come up a lot in the different patterns that we are gonna learn. And the squiggly brackets reference, uh, create a block of code or a code block. And so when I use these squiggly brackets, everything that's inside them gets modified by the expression that's before them. So as an example, you know, without, without a statement, ignore these rounded brackets. I'm just talking about the squiggly brackets. If I, let's say I put some really long, um, this is some really long block of code. And for this example, they're all going to be this, it's all going to be the same, but let's just pretend these were different lines of code. All right. These squiggly brackets, um, for everything inside them, it allows them to get modified by the expression that comes before them. Okay, so for an if statement, this is the code block that will run if, if um, the if statement is true. In a for each statement, um, this is the code block that will run for every value of the array. Okay, so uh, the squiggly brackets create a discrete block of code, all right? Now, the rounded brackets, on the other hand, are but to be honest with you, they're a little bit harder to explain because they have different uses in different contexts. In this context, in the context of an if statement, the rounded brackets house the expression 
that we want to evaluate in our if statement. So remember before we were using this age example. So age equals you know, 15. And so if age is less than 18, see, note that our rounded brackets house the expression that I want to check is true. And if that expression is true, the code block housed by the squiggly brackets will run. Okay. Now it's a little bit different in the for each loop. In the for each loop, the rounded brackets house the name of our array and then this weird as expression. Um, and remember that this, this, this as person basically just, is just saying every time I run the array, for each, for each value in the array, I want you to store it in the value person. Okay. And then the third type of brackets we've been using. So, so we've got our squiggly brackets, which are code blocks, our round brackets, which house different things depending on the pattern that we're using. And then we've got our, uh, uh, I don't need a new example. Then we've got our rounded brackets and in PHP, Rounded brackets are exclusively used in the context of an array. So remember that an array is a list of values like this one. And in this case, the rounded bracket, the square brackets help us define the array. So we've created a new array and stored it inside person. Or they help us access, access a value in the array. So remember that I can go um, people two. And that's so um, we might actually do a bit of question and answer. Um, let's just delete this for now. This is a bit of revision to what we covered just before. Um, uh, I'll answer that question in a second, Dr. B. Um, so if you recall when I introduced arrays, um, I taught you how to understand what this output would be. So if you want to have a guess in the chat, I'm going to run this code. And I want you to tell me when it echoes people to what the value output will be. If you want to have a guess, I'll give you maybe 15 seconds. So Dr. B is guessing Chloe, Fatima, from Nikhil. <clears throat> All right, in the interest of time, we might move on. So remember, this is a little trick that's in almost every programming language. Uh, I can see why you might have thought Chloe because you feel like Marie is number one, right? Well, Marie is actually number zero. So the answer is Fatima because Marie is zero, Chloe is one, Fatima is two. Okay, so if I run by, I'll just clear it to be, um, to be a bit easier to interpret. And we can see we've got Fatima as our output, all right? So I'd, um, again, I don't, uh, blame anyone. There's no wrong answers here. Uh, just remember that yeah, it starts from zero. It's really confusing. Um, now, Dr. B is asking, did I already code that people and person belong to the same category? How does it know that person is a people? Sorry if the question is basic. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Um, so I can, when I write a, a for each loop, I can, I can give those two variables any value that I want. So the first value is just an array, the name of our array. So people is our array. And then, um, and then this second one, I can use any name I want for this. So um, just to be a bit silly, uh, I'm gonna use a really silly name. So for each person as table, okay? Now if I go echo table, and then I'm just putting in a new line character, ignore this. I run this now. You can see that it still prints the people. So I can see why that other example would be a little bit confusing because it kind of feels like person and people are related, but they're not. All I'm doing in this part is I'm putting in a another name to house those. <laughs> yeah, okay, you get it. Yeah, the, the the name has nothing to do with it. You literally just put in any name there and. That is the, the variable that you want to use to store each value of the array when you run the, the loop, okay? All right, a couple more patterns to learn. I know we're just churning through it today, but at the end, we're gonna try and build something pretty cool. And I need all of these 
block building blocks to help us do it. So the next pattern we're going to learn is a while pattern. Okay. So let's start with some random variable. We're going to call this number. So, and we're going to store zero inside it. And then I'm going to introduce this while pattern. All right. Okay. And so uh, it's also known as a while loop. So what a while loop does is much like an if statement, it will check if the expression in the rounded brackets is true. And if so, it will run this code block. At the end of that code block, it will check again whether this expression is true and then it will run this code block. And it will check again and it will run this code block if it's true. So basically you get this loop that will run an infinite number of times checking whether this value is true um, each time. And if it's ever equal to false, it will then continue. So let's do an example. So I've got this number um, and I've set it to zero. And so while number is less than six, let's echo the number. Let's echo a new line. And then we'll set the value of number to the current value of number plus one. All right. So if I clear this and I run out loop now, you can see that even though I've only got one echo statement, oh, one real echo statement in here, it's echoed of six different things, six different values. And the reason for that is the first time it runs the code block, um, number is zero. So zero is less than six, which is true. Therefore this code block runs. And then down here in number, we add, a, add one to it. So the next time this runs, number is equal to one. So one is less than six. So the code block runs and you can see that kind of it loops through it um, until we get to the end. Until we get to the very last one where number is equal to five when it starts. So five is less than six. That's true. The code block will run. And then down here, we add one to the number and then suddenly number is equal to six. And so when it comes back to here, it says, is six less than six? And the answer is no. So this code block skips and the program is terminated. So a while loop will repeat this code block for as, many, as long as this expression is true. All right. Now if I just look at my lesson plan here. Now we can, we can get really a little bit silly here and we can put we can just flat out put the expression true into this program. And now there's no way for that expression to ever equal anything other than true because I've literally just put the word true in there. So let's watch what happens if I run this program with the expression true in there. And you can see We've created an infinite loop. I don't know how well you can see it on your screens, but this program is, it's up to about, a, just crossed a thousand or a million. It's running, you know, many, 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 many times a second. And it's adding number one to number each time and it's echoing it. So we've essentially created like an infinite program. And if I run this for long enough, this thing will crash because that number will just get so, so, so long that there won't be enough, you know, memory on my computer to store this number. Um, and that's something that you can accidentally do when you use a while loop, you can accidentally create an infinite loop, um, which in this case, we have some visual output so we can see what's going on. But in some, sometimes if I, if I get rid of this, um, and I run, if I, if I get rid of the echo number statement, if I get rid of both echo statements, and I'll clear it just for clarity to be obvious. And I run it now. You can see how we haven't got any output and it kind of looks like this thing's frozen. And the, it, it, the reason it's frozen is that I've hung the program because there's an infinite loop and it can never get out of it. A computer will never get out of it because they don't understand. They don't understand in the way that we do. They don't understand that they're going nowhere quickly. Is this an example of some simple malware to crash someone's computer maliciously? Kind of, yeah. I don't know if you've ever had a, 
computer program that says they're not responding, I'm sure you have, and you have to like X out of it. That can be for lots of different reasons, but one of them could be that for some incidental reason, there's an infinite loop that is running and therefore the computer can never get out of it. And so that's a way that a computer program can become not responsive and the operating system is kind of prodding it, asking it to do things, but it's stuck in an infinite loop. And so it doesn't, it will never give that information back. It's, uh, operating system is actually a lot more complicated than that, but that's the other general idea. Um, okay, so that's a while loop. All right, so let's get building our thing that I want to build for this class. So, so far we've only really, oh, there's one more pattern we've got to learn. One, one more pattern, all right? So we've learned about arrays, which are lists of values. We've learned about for each loops, that let us cycle through an array and repeat a block of code for every value in that array. And then we're talking about while loops. And while loops will repeat a block of code as long as the expression in the while brackets is true. The next pattern we're gonna learn is a thing called functions, all right? And so when, when you're writing a big complicated computer program, we want uh, we want reusable blocks of code. For example, if I'm doing some sort of health app and I want to be able to calculate people's BMIs really, really quickly, that body mass index, I want to be able to calculate it in lots of different situations. I want to have a reusable block of code that I know will calculate someone's BMI accurately. So what we use are functions and functions are just yeah discrete blocks of code that we can reuse let me give you an example we're going to create a new function so I, I use the keyword function and then I give it some name in this case I'm going to call the function greet I use some rounded brackets here for now which for now we'll just leave empty and then I introduce some squiggly brackets. Remember that a squiggly bracket is a block of code. So in this, in this function, we're gonna say, welcome to you know, at Clinic Engine Summer School. Okay. And then we're gonna say, uh, echo PHP EOL. So um, remember, remembering that that's just a new line character, so don't worry too much about it. And now let's run, the, uh, should I run this? Yeah, let's run this code block. All right, so I've, what I've done is I've defined a new function called greet. And whenever I call the function greet, I want this code block to run, okay? So I've defined a function. And if I run the script now, you'll see that I get no output. I don't get any output because defining a function doesn't create any output, even though there's an echo statement in there. If I want to execute that function, I need to actually call the function. I need to, to invoke the function. I need to use the function. And anytime I use a function, um, a, a program is just, just use the word, uh, use the verb call to call a function. So this is me calling a function here using the name of the function and then some brackets followed by a semicolon. So let's see what happens if I run it now. Welcome to the App Clinic Engine Summer School. Awesome. Now, um, this kind of contrived example doesn't really make that much sense. But just note that if I add a, this greet function in you know, six or seven times here and I save the file and run it, you can see that it's created a reusable block of code. I, I can call the, every any time I want to call the greet function, I can and it will um, and it will run this block of code for me. So that's a pretty cool thing. Like let's say we've got a website and we have a uh, a menu on the side of the website. I don't want to have to manually create that website that menu on every single page. So why don't I create a function that yields the menu and then use that function? Um, any to anywhere I want to create the menu. That way I only have to maintain one block of code, which is this one. Okay. Uh, 
So next, now very often when we run a function, we want there to be some sort of input variables to help us um, use it. In the case of uh, BMI, I'm conscious that we'll be going for about 45 minutes, but stay with me, it'll be worth it, I promise you. Um, so in the case of BMI, we're gonna, we need some sort of input values to help us calculate the BMI, right? We need a height and we need a weight, okay? Let's just get rid of this. And so notice that in our function definition, in our function definition, I've introduced these two variables here and these are called arguments, okay? So arguments, are inputs to a function that it, um, that it requires to operate. So in the case of the BMI calculator, we need a height and a weight to be able to accurately calculate someone's BMI. Okay, now if I go, um, oh no, I don't wanna do that. Let's just go echo, um, I always forget this formula. It's, it's a weight on height times height, is that what it is? Yeah, I think so. So in this case, um, we're going to use uh, the two input arguments in our function. And now if I go, um, and just for, I will actually add this back in. So now I can go uh, um, calculate BMI. So I'm calling the function here. I'm going to put in a height of 1.86 and a weight of 94. So let's run this. And you can see it's calculated that BMI there. But now let's do a different BMI. Let's go 195 and 88. I'm sort of making these values up. And now you, you can see I've got two different BMIs here. The function, and let's do a third one for simplicity's sake. You know, this, this person's quite tall. 206 and they're fairly heavy as well. Um, you can see I've got three separate BMIs that have all been calculated here. So a function creates a reusable block of logic. So that's quite a useful thing to have, all right? Okay, now we're gonna build something cool. So the main way, and, and don't expect to understand this, this in, in full, and because we're running out of time, I'm kind of gonna rush through it a little bit. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is explain that when you write a, most modern computer programs, you don't actually write everything from scratch. In the same way that a builder, when they're building a house, uses bricks made by other people, I, as a software developer, will use mini programs called packages that have been written by other people. And so what I'm gonna do now, while I'm explaining all of this, is I'm gonna use another computer program called Composer, which is a really common PHP program, which helps us manage these packages that have been built by other people. Um, so just before I continue, Re Fernandez is, is, is there a way to restrict the BMI result to a certain number of decimal digits, e.g. 27.23 instead of all the decimals? Yeah, we can absolutely do that. Let's just quickly do that before we... Um, so if I, if I surround it in this round expression, I think this is how it's done in PHP. Let me just, yeah, you can see that's rounded it to zero decimal places. And I think if I put a second value in this, if I say, say five, does that give us five decimal places? Yeah, that does. So you use this round expression. And then if I go 10, that'll give us 10 decimal places. Yeah, you get the idea. Um, so back to my analogy of this house that we're building, we're using bricks made by other, other software developers instead of building, instead of you know, making our own bricks out of clay. Okay? You don't reinvent the wheel. And, one of the, and so when you're writing a computer program, you might use hundreds of packages that have been written by other people. You know, ones that help you send emails and ones that help you um, send messages to Twitter, etc. And speaking of which, um, I, this is a package that I use. And so, again, don't worry too much about this. Explaining how Composer works is kind of a whole lecture in itself. But what I'm doing now is I've just asked this Composer program to download a package uh, that help, will help us talk to Twitter. 
okay? Uh, and so just while that's happening now, um, there's a website called um, uh, a packagist, which is a, um, I'll put it into the chat, it's a bit of a mouthful of a name. And what that is, is it's a website that's dedicated to PHP packages. So you can just go on there and browse and just see what um, you can do with, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of packages up there, all for free, um, that let you do certain things like send emails, access Excel spreadsheets, send text messages, whatever you want to do. Okay. And the one, the package that I've just installed, which you can see now up on my screen, it's finished is it lets us interact with the Twitter API. And an API is a, for example, if I'm Twitter, I set up what's called an API so that developers like me in my, in my study can interact with my website in a certain way. So uh, Twitter has an API that lets us do things like read comment sections, make comments, retweet posts, like posts. Um, and if you can read the information from Twitter, you can then do anything you want with it, just like what we've been doing. So I could take, I could get all the, you know, tweets that I've made and ever and, you know, echo them out or, or put them into an Excel spreadsheet or email them to anyone or just, you can do anything that you can do with um, that information. You can do anything that you can do with a computer program with that information, okay? And so I've just installed this package and that I, I, I know that this package exists, but if you didn't know that it existed, you could go and find it on packages. Okay. And then I, and then um, you come to this guy's GitHub. So this is the guy that's made the package, a guy named um, I think Dave, someone, Dave Grudel. So this guy has just published this package. And when you publish a package, you are very, very often you, you publish this kind of like um, explanation of how to use it. So I don't, I don't, know from memory how to use this. When I want to use it, I just can't, I know that this guy has a, um, a, this is his GitHub page, which is kind of like, it's like a social media site kind of for code where you can post it and share it and do all sorts of stuff. If you want to, I recommend making an account on GitHub if you want to get into this kind of thing. Um, and he explains here how to use it all. All right, so we're gonna just, we're just gonna grab this little bit here. And, um, we're gonna turf this for now. And we're gonna just um, be a little bit of stuff here. So the first thing I need to do is include, include or, or um, suck in all of the code that Composer has installed for us. And the way that you do this, I don't, again, don't worry too much about this. So this is basically a little line that includes all of the packages that um, Composer has installed for us. And then I also need to include this other file that I prepared before the lecture. So this file here, secrets. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna click on this. This has some information in it that basically allows me to identify myself to Twitter. So, um, for, you know, if, if I if I shared that those secrets with you, you would be able to write a computer program that would send messages to Twitter as me. So I can't share them with you, but I've hidden them. In this, in these, in these purple words here. So I've I've hidden them just because I don't want to. Um, um, uh, I've hidden them in these purple words. So don't 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 worry if you again. Don't worry if you don't understand this too much. Um, Just see if that is going to run. I don't know. Do I have an IP? That's what I call it. Um, there we go. Um, cool. So that is working. All right, so now let's just have a bit of a flip, um, a flip through this page here. Okay, so the send method updates your status. Oh, that looks pretty cool. Let's let's try running that. 
Um, so I'm going to use this twin um, send expression as, and say, hey, does anyone want a copy? I'm going to run this. Note that it took a second or two there. And the reason it took a second or two is because it was sending a message to Twitter. And so if I come to my Twitter page now, hey, does anyone want a coffee 11 seconds ago? Pretty cool. So it didn't take that long to write a program that can send things to Twitter, right? That's pretty awesome. Um, all right, so that's the send method on this package. Um, then we can also use the load method, which in turn returns the 20 most recent status updates by me. So let's try that one. So note that this, this load function gets called and it um, stores it in statuses. Now we're going to use a for each loop. So for each statuses as status, um, yeah, you know what? Let's, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, now, um, now print, print underscore R is very, very similar to um, echo, but we're just going to use print R in this instance for a reason that I won't go into. Okay. And so I, now I've got this big long list of the last 20 tweets that I've done. And here's, and here's the kind of information that it gives me what time the, the tweet was created at. Um, Okay, and this is on like some Twitter argument I got into this guy, into with this guy a day or two ago, which is really embarrassing. But that's up on screen, and you know you can see what post it was in reply to. You can see the author, so obviously the author is me, so Josh Case, with my location, my just the description on my bio, links to my profile picture and stuff. So I could write another program if I wanted that could pull all these profile pictures down and, for example, look at them in an um, in an AI bot if you wanted to. Uh, so that's this, um, and just to be a bit clearer, let's, let's just, um, let's have a look at the very, very first of the statuses. So remember status is zero. This is, remember statuses is just an array. So I can use for each, I can use this, I can access the numerical indexes on them. Um, uh, yeah, actually I can't do that. I have to use print underscore R. Oh, what's the function of the line? Yeah. Okay. So this is a um, this is a pattern that we haven't spoken about yet, and I don't have time to because I want to quickly finish this demo. But basically, this is a function that exists inside the Twitter object, and so this line basically lets you get functions outside of this Twitter object. Can you see how I've created this Twitter object here? And so it's stored inside Twitter, and there's this load function that exists inside the Twitter object. And I use this line to kind of get functions outside of them. The pattern is known as a class. I don't have time to go into detail, but basically a class is a collection of functions and values that are logically related. So in this case, all of the logic relating to Twitter is stored inside this Twitter object. And so I, um, cause example, for example, the name, the function load is a fairly generic name. And so I want to be crystal clear that I'm using load in the context of Twitter. So Twitter line load. Yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit confusing. Um, um, and so this is the, yeah, again, this is just one tweet object that I've got here now, which has all that information. Um, and I just want you to note this in reply to status ID field, because we're going to use that a bit later. All right. Um, now there's, there's lots of other stuff you can do here. <clears throat> the one I'm really interested in, is this thing called, where is it? Um, somewhere. Requests, okay. So um, you can use all commands from the Twitter API using this request function, all right? And so how would I know what the Twitter API does? Well, I would come to the API reference, which is a website that had, this is a website created by Twitter it has all the different things you can do with their API. So I would come and if you were wanted to build something on Twitter, just come and look and you can click on any of these <clears throat> and they'll explain what they do. Now I might, I might skip a little ahead a little bit um, because again, we're, we're dragging out on time a little bit. Um, so we're going to use this search function. Um, so just look at my lesson plan. We're going to use this, um, uh, 
so, so this request this request function lets us access any of the API endpoints. <clears throat> so I'm going to grab this. I'm going to put this here instead. So result equals Twitter request. And so the endpoint that I'm going to reach is um, search. Where is it? Um, not users search. Uh, I won't show you the, the reference doc, but I, I found it in here last night. Okay, so the, the thing I'm going to use is um, search slash tweets. Okay, um, and then I'm going to use get ignore this uh, for now. And the thing that I'm going to search for is for tweets that are two. You can see I'm using this two expression, and then two Josh case. All right. So I'm, I'm searching Twitter for any tweets that are directed to me. Okay. And then I'm going to go um, ignore this line for now. I, I'm, I'm using this line to simplify things a little bit um, just for the sake of the demonstration. Actually, no, I don't, don't think I need it. Um, let's go. So, so um, this function gives us a search result. And then, um, so I'm going to store the tweets. So um, in here, which is going to be um, uh, okay. So um, this is search Twitter for tweets that are directed at me. And then get uh, this line is a little hard to explain, but I'll, I can show you what we get. Um, So search Twitter for tweets that are directed to me. Five more minutes, I promise. Um, and if I go a city class, oh, um, yeah, so, um, Um, where is it? Um, don't worry too much about it. So essentially what I'm saying is search um, tweets that are relevant for me and then um, search Twitter for tweets that are, that are addressed to me and then store these, um, the result of that search in this variable called tweets, okay? And so now I've got a big long array of tweets that are targeted towards me. And this is all the tweets that have happened in the last, you know, um, I'm just gonna put a, a limit on how many there are here, just a hundred of them. So all the tweets that have been sent to me in recent memory, all right? And I've got them stored in this array called tweets. So what I'm gonna do now is a for each thing. So for each tweets as tweet, Remember, this is a for each loop that we already know. We're going to go if this, um, we're going to use an if statement now. So if that tweets, if that tweet is in reply to, so the first thing to know about Twitter is that every, every tweet has a, an ID to it. And so you can come up into the URL here and I've just clicked on this tweet that I sent to you. And look, it looks like a few people ordered coffee is awesome. I was worried I was going to order one. Um, if I come up here, I can see this number here on the tweet. If I grab that, this is that the ID for that tweet. And so now if this tweet, um, if, the, if it's in reply to this tweet ID, what we're going to do is echo the tweet text. Okay. So let's see what happens. I bet you this won't run. It never works the first time. <clears throat> oh, okay. So it did work. So we can see a whole lot of different stuff there. Let's um, let's just add a new line character in there. Okay. Here, so here I can see. <laughs> so someone wants an Oreo milkshake and no coffee. Um, so this this. Program 
is using the Twitter API to get all the tweets that have been sent to me. And then this for each loop goes through and it looks for each tweet that is in reply to this post. Remember this, this is the ID that I grabbed from up here. That's this post here. And then if we want to extend this even further, we could do something like um, tweet user name. And we're going to tie in some concatenation that we learned in the first lesson. Um, so um, this would give the, the username of the person who caffeine and I don't mix says Fatima. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I don't know how you're going to, how you live your life in a hospital without caffeine, but I, <laughs> anyway. Um, so we're going to use some concatenation. Um, so tweet username would like a, you know, like a tweet text. So. Let me just tie this up. So I'm just putting a little, a little bit of syntax here. So let's clear and let's run again. So Anna C would like a hot chocolate with whipped cream and marshmallows and Hassan would like a cinnamon dolce latte. I don't even know what that is. Oh, latte. And then Chloe Jordan would like a flat white, please. And Maria would like an iced Americano with milk. Fatima would like an Oreo milkshake. And I'd like a regular fat loaf. So you can see essentially what we've done here <clears throat> is um, I've created this bot that will look at that post, look in the comments and get them all and store them in this tweets um, array. Remember that an array is a list of values. I then use a for each loop, which loops over the tweets and for every, and it will, so it will repeat this block for every single tweet. For each of the hundred tweets that they got from Twitter, it checks whether that tweet is in reply to this post. And if it is, it then echoes the order out into the terminal, okay? So now as a developer, you might say, okay, this is great. I can echo this stuff out here. Where would I wanna go? What, how can I take this to the next level? How can I, oh, um, how can I get this to actually do something more useful than just this? So Reed is asking me line 20, what's after the concatenate? Um, so line 20 here, there's nothing here. I literally just put a, um, you don't even need this. I just put a <clears throat> thing in, uh, a thing in the end. This, this quotation mark, I just put that quotation mark in the end. Um, okay, so we've got all our coffee orders. We're echoing them out into the terminal. But what could I do with them? Well, that's the beautiful thing about the world of programming is that so many other people have already done the hard yakka for them. Yakka for you or hard work for you. So with all this list of orders, um, I could get another package like Swift Mailer or PHP Mailer that could automatically email those orders to the coffee shop if I wanted to. I could use a, I think a service called Twilio, which is a, a company that helps you send text messages using a program. Mm -hmm. So I could write a program that would text the order to the intern on the way in or the medical student and they would pick them up on the way in. I could, post it onto Facebook. So there's a Facebook, see look, there's a Facebook package here that helps you read Facebook posts and make Facebook posts. So I could, or I could send it as a Facebook DM to someone or I could, I could Facebook DM the coffee shop and say, hey, here are all our orders. I could send a fax to someone. Again, you, so most of the hospitals I work in still use faxes. So things like um, Twilio, um, which is that company that also helps you send text messages, also helps you send faxes. So you could take down all the orders and write a program that will fax it to the coffee shop. Um, if you were doing some sort of, uh, if you wanted to, you could store it in an Excel spreadsheet. So you come and grab one of these Excel, pack, Excel spreadsheet packages and use the functions in there to store them into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you could use um, a package called FPDI, which is one that I use sometimes that helps you make PDFs. So you could, get this sort of template and print all the coffee orders onto the template and send it around. Basically, once you, once you understand that um, lots of other people have built little bits and pieces that you can turn into a program, you can, you can really do whatever you want with them, you know? Um, and again, this is a very contrived example where we've turned a Twitter thread into a little coffee ordering app. But um, let me um, just add one last little piece to this. Um, I, I forgot that I was gonna do this. Um, 
we remember how we learned about the while pattern. So while true, so um, let's put a code block here. And then I'm going to put this entire thing in here. All right. So <clears throat> this, um, this whole code block is in the while loop now. It's just going to keep happening. Now, I don't, what I don't want to happen, remember how when I ran this last time, the counter was going up really, really, really quickly. It was running about 50 times a second. I don't want to spam the Twitter, the Twitter API because then they'll block me. So at the end of each loop, I'm going to put this sleep for sleep 10 here, which basically means wait for 10 seconds. So let's look what happens if we run this now. Okay, so it's going to load them all. And now it's sleeping for 10 seconds. Oh, let me just add one of these. Um, let me run this script. So it's checked for all the orders and they're all there. And let me, what I'm going to go do now is I'm going to go, if we just wait. <clears throat> and you can see 10 seconds later, it's run it again and it's looked for more coffee orders. So I'm going to add, I'm going to change my coffee order and say, actually, a long black, please. So I just, I just tweeted that then. Um, <clears throat> and so let's see if it pops up next time. So here you go. There's my last order, Josh Case, with like, actually, a long black, please. And so this is actually the basis for my Twitter bot that guests in medical specialty. It's on another computer just running looking for new retweets to that post and then sending replies to them. All right, I'm conscious that we've gone way over time. That's all the material I had prepared. Um, thank you for persisting. This went a lot longer than expected, but I hope to be able to show to you that just with a few fairly common programming patterns, you can actually make some pretty cool computer programs. Um, and I've already touched on where you can take this, you know, you can write emails, you can text people, you can get Excel spreadsheets, you can write other programs that pull information from websites. You can, you could write a bot that would look in, you know, your favorite journals for research on a certain topic and then text you when something gets published. You can <clears throat> use this for research purposes. It's the world is really your oyster. So I know three classes in a very long time to sort of, um, get into all this kind of stuff. Um, but I hope that I've given you a taste. I hope that I've made you um, interested and excited to be in this um, scene because I think there's lots and lots of opportunities for people who, um, you know, dive into this kind of thing. Um, this is the last course, uh, Dr. B is asking if this is the last course I'm giving. This is the last course I'm giving uh, as part of this little run of courses. I hope to do more in the future. I, I'm passionate about getting more healthcare workers engaged with technology and learning technical skills. Um, and Fatima says she's been so excited about coding ever since she started these. Thank you for saying that. That's a very um, uh, heartwarming thing to hear. Um, Rahaf says, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, so I guess where to from here? Um, I do have a blog post where I talk a little bit more in general about the, like, the philosophy of how I recommend learning to code. So um, if you want to learn more about that there, you can click it here. Um, otherwise, I'd love to you know, take a direct message from you if you have specific things that you want to build or you want advice about where to go. Um, you, you can always message me on Twitter or tweet at me um, or email me. I'll put my email um, up on screen. <clears throat> so that's my email there. Whoops. Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to take any questions about either programming in general or the stuff we did today or um, where to go next or anything like that. Um, so Dr. B says, can coding be built to scour an electronic medical record for specific words to find patients with symptoms or diagnoses? So <clears throat> in practical terms, absolutely, yes, they can. It depends what kind of EMR you have. Um, that is a little bit more complicated for a couple of reasons, Dr. B, and we touched on this in the last class. Be extremely, extremely careful writing programs that relate to patient data, especially as a beginner. So that, that you, there are things that you can do that can kind of um, muck things up. So I certainly wouldn't be modifying any patient data in any way, 
I would be reading it and reading it only to begin with. Um, also, if I was going to do that, I would check with my IT governance committee or you know your hospital data custodians or whoever controls the data at your hospital and make sure you're they're cool with you doing that. Now, you know, for this kind of thing is very common for you know department audits or um, quality control staff or for research and. Up until you know, semi recently, people have had to do this manually. You know, they've had to trawl through the information manually and put all the data into a spreadsheet or whatever. Um, my opinion is, if I have access to the data manually, then I should. The manner in which I access it shouldn't matter. Um, but I encourage you to uh, talk to your IT committee before you do anything. I also note that running software that you write on a hot on a hospital server is actually a little bit complicated they tend to have them locked down because they don't want you to write something that will compromise their network which i can totally understand um, but i also want to be clear that there's there's 101 different things that you can do before you get to the point of where you have to do that you can still make really useful stuff like um i don't want to promote my own book but in the book that i'm writing we make this um very simple um, uh, app where you can basically put in all the information for a chest x-ray into like a HTML form and then it will generate a PDF request and then email it to a radiology department to get a scan ordered, for example. Dr. B asks, are there any certification or academic program that would be targeted for doctors to learn how to code? Uh, that's a great question. I actually don't, there, there, there are, there are some, um, not strictly computer science ones they're sort of like dumb, that i'm aware of um but i actually want to reframe your, your thinking a little bit um i think coming from medical academia everyone sort of wants a qualification or they want a um a degree or something like that or, or an academic program um the world of programming is actually very very different in that, in that the world and the technology world moves so quickly that there's no real, in my opinion, no real curriculum that is um, reflects modern development in to the fullest extent, basically because new tools and stuff are coming out all the time. And so the best way to actually learn programming is by building projects. My, I have a whole philosophy on this, but basically find any free or otherwise um, source of introductory materials. So a book or like a website, in the prior lecture, I had a whole list of them that I recommend. Um, follow the introduction, introductory materials to a beginner or intermediate level, just enough to find your feet. And once you've found your feet, abandon the tutorials and then just try to build stuff. If by trying to build stuff is how you will learn. You will not learn. It's not like a, you know, up for a medical school exam where you can just do 750 questions and then just know and then just do really really well you have to go through that process of not knowing how to proceed and then you know getting onto the packages and flicking through a random package and then you know going to the packages github and looking at how you use it and then um, that that kind of that creative process is how you learn. It's not by just sitting there doing exercises. Yeah. All right. I'm conscious that I've gone way over time. I want to thank you all for your patience. I want to thank you all for having me as part of summer school. I want to thank Maria, Chloe, Faisal, um, everyone that's been part of the team. I think it's been a real success. I think people um, are really excited about this kind of stuff. Um, I'm excited to be part of it. Stay connected to me. Keep messaging me if you get stuck. I'm very happy to help you through the next kind of next few steps. Um, help, happy to get you on the right direction. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. Please reach out if you've if you've got any other questions or 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 want even want to just talk about technology and medicine and that sort of stuff. I'm I'm all ears. <clears throat> Thank you so much, George, for int introducing us to the world of coding and teach us, teaching us such exciting and cool things um, like today. I'm sure that uh, the knowledge that we have gained now uh, is invaluable and will help us build our coding skills in the future. Um, uh, dear participants, we will upload the webinar to YouTube tomorrow. Thank you everyone for joining and stay tuned for our future events. Have a good night. Thank Thanks, you. George, again. Thank you.